Well, hello there, everybody. My name is Dee Dee Berg, and I am your host on Let's Talk Hypnosis, brought to you by HypnoThoughts 2018 Live. And today it is my very special privilege to introduce to you Sean Carson. Welcome to the show, Carson. Hi, Dee Dee. Thanks for inviting me. Wonderful, wonderful. So let me tell you a little bit about Sean. Sean is the co-founder of The Intelligent Hypnotist and a certified humanistic neurolinguistic psychology trainer, a hypnosis trainer, and a brain-based leadership trainer. He's also the co-author of over 16 books and is the recipient of the prestigious I Act Pen and Quill Award. When Sean isn't training or writing, He's busy working with clients from around the world. So at this year's HypnoThoughts, Sean is going to be offering a one-hour workshop on John Overdurf in a nutshell and a three-day pre-conference workshop entitled Conversational Hypnotic Coaching, an Introduction to Overdurfian Hypnotic Coaching. So Sean, tell us a little bit about John Overdurf and who he is for those who are wondering. Okay, well, thanks for the introduction. I don't know who that amazing person was that you... <laughs> that you described, but um, thanks very much anyway. So um, John Overdurf is our teacher, mentor, uh, friend. He's the cap. He's the co-founder of HNLP. Okay. Uh, HNLP came out of NLP. So NLP, if you know anything about NLP, uh, the the sort of the predicate of NLP is the idea of the mind as a computer. Mm-hmm. So when we do change work, we are sort of rewiring the computer, which is kind of okay on a neural. Um, basis, if you think right. of change work as being rewiring neurons, mm-hmm. but but it's kind of not a very good approach if you're dealing with an actual person in front of you, yeah. who, who, right? Who has all the stuff a person with has? With feelings and emotions. Feelings, emotions. That's exactly right. That's absolutely mm-hmm. perfectly right. So the HNLP approach, um, as developed by John and uh, his uh, his ex partner Julie Silverthorne, um, mm-hmm. really takes that idea that a person. Uh, is not a computer, and the principal difference between a person and a computer is a person has a body, mm-hmm. and it's the body which allows a person to actually feel emotions. Right? Computers don't have a body, so so a computer can't feel emotions in the same way that, that we can. Right. So so the basis of NL, the basis of HNLP coaching is we're coaching the body. Okay. So you're taking into account all the emotions and and everything that goes along with. We are primarily coaching the body. So what that means is, um, essentially, in the first instance, mm-hmm. and we're not ignoring the brain, the mind, okay. but in the first instance, we're looking to change the response the body has right. to the context and the trigger, which would normally cause the, the client a problem. Right. So even if the client doesn't think they're changing, uh-huh. if we say, if we see the physiological change right. in how they react to the stimulus, we know we're moving in the right direction. Okay, good, good, good. Okay. Uh, and then once we've got that change, then at, more towards the end of the process, we allow the conscious mind to catch up with the facts that they've changed. Oh, so it's kind of like slipping in a little change under the radar. Yeah, so if you think about the brain, uh, yeah. uh, the brain has two ways of functioning. It's got top down, which means you think about what you want and you go and do it sounds great and then there's bottom up which means your body reacts to to the context in which you're in uh, and then the brain makes sense of it afterwards okay. so if you, if you take like the simple case of a smoker okay. right the smoker comes into your office and says I want to stop smoking right then stop smoking it's very easy if you if you think right. about top down right all they have to do is to stop smoking yes very you know, they, very they, rational very Logical. Very rational, right? This is a bad thing. It costs me money. It's bad for my health. Therefore, I'll stop it. Some people do that, right? They go, okay, I'll stop. And they throw the cigarettes mm-hmm. away and, and they don't need to come and see you. But the ones who can't, they that, that top-down processing where they want to stop just doesn't work for them. Okay. So really, change work for most of the clients who walk, who walk into your office is about that bottom-up. The body comes first right. and then the mind is making sense of that. Right, right, amazing, amazing. Because you also talk about, so I, I understand that you also do brain-based coaching. So, and and tell us a little bit about that and how that works into everything that you're talking about. Right. So brain-based basically means we take into account how 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 the brain. And we say brain-based, but um, really it's the brain and the body. Okay. Right. It's the nervous system. Um, so so it's the brain, but it reaches out to the to the very front of the eyes. It reaches out to the ears. 
reaches out to the skin, it reaches out to the organs, it reaches out to uh, the end of every nerve in your body. Okay. Uh, and we're considering how that um, works in terms of if, if we're running a training course, if it's training, mm -hmm. then how does the person's brain and neurology actually work mm -hmm. um, and how do we use that um, to help them to learn. So again, if we think about, as an example, top-down and bottom-up, um, top-down type of training means you sit the people in front of you and you right. give them a bunch of information. Sure. Right. So then rationally, they know that information and right. they can apply it. But we all know that's not how the training works, no. right? They, they take that information in and then they, they forget about it because mm -hmm. it didn't mean anything. It didn't connect with who they are as a person, right? So bottom up, right. the, the training or inductive type of training is you give your class an experience, right? So they yes. experience something and then you explain um, what that experience means and how to use that experience in their practice so that it, it first gets wired into their body and then their brain makes sense of it at the end. And that makes perfect sense. So it does make, yeah. John Overder, for those of you, um, for those of people out there who don't know exactly who he is, he's got a lot of great followers. I know Melissa Tears follows him. I believe Igor Lidahovsky follows Igor, him. Yeah. There's a lot of people that um, use him as their mentor. So, yeah. um, Tell us a little bit about the, the three-day, it's a pre-conference, correct? It is a pre-conference, yeah. Tell so it's the three days prior to the conference. So this is entitled Conversational Hypnotic Coaching, an Introduction to Overdorphian Hypnotic Coaching. So what can people expect to take away with them when they take this sort of training based on John Overdorf? So the training, um, the purpose of the training really is to give people um, a complete view of the Overdurfian style of training, i.e. how do you actually coach the body? You coach the body in the first instance right. and then you allow the mind to catch up. Um, so if you think about how different people train, mm -hmm. different people train at different levels of abstraction. So if, if you think of a Melissa Tears, for mm -hmm. example, uh, sh she'll give a, a one hour training and, and she'll show you 10 or 15 different things. Right? So she chunks down to um, a level of techniques where, where she's showing you one, one relatively small, compact thing, and then another one, and then another one. Uh, so different people uh, train at different levels mm -hmm. of abstraction. The purpose of this training is really to give a three-day uh, feel, a three-day introduction to really how to coach the unconscious mind, how to coach the body um, using the, the Overdurfian style. So it's it's it it builds right so so right. there's the basic idea how do you first get the body to change mm -hmm. in response to the context in which the client normally has the problem uh, and then leading from that how do you extend that how do you uh, deal uh, with the cases where you don't get that change in the first instance and then how do you deal with the cases where mm -hmm. the client goes ah yes but right because now they're using their top right. down Right. to argue against the change. Right? Okay, Even though they that, may have yeah. felt change, they're going to say, uh, yes, but... They didn't understand how they felt the change, so they have to make sense of it. They have to make sense of it, and if they make sense of it in a positive way, that's great, but if they make sense of it in a, well, it can't have been that easy because it only took two minutes right. to, to differently, right. so they, they then have to push back to justify why they've had this problem for years and years and years, and then you move on to the more of the cognitive... Uh, side of the chain. Right, but. that's sometimes in effect almost undoing your work. They try and undo your work, yeah. yeah. I mean, I know, I recall a, um early client where I did all this amazing change work and, and she felt fantastic and she's like, wow, I feel fantastic. And then she's literally walking out the door and she says, it's a shame it won't work in the real world. Oh, right? oh, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah, God, yeah, I, yeah. Just blew, I just blew that whole change work because I didn't allow the conscious yeah. mind to catch up with what had taken place. Yeah. Right? That's really the key, the, uh, key to the end of the process in terms of the overdurfy and change is you have to allow the conscious mind not only to catch up and yeah. realize that it's changed, right. but to start to argue in favor of that change. Okay. So at the end of the process, you as the hypnotist want to be saying, or the coach, um, have you really changed? 
And they go, yeah, I've changed. I know yeah, I've changed. Yeah, you get changed. them to prove it to you. Yeah. Right. How do you they know have to that? Prove it at the end of the process. How do you know right. it's going to be different next time? <laughs> yeah, so that took a, a lot of years to learn to do that. I, I had unfortunate experiences like you in the beginning, but sometimes it just, you know, we go to trainings like yours. I was at your training last year, and then we learn, like, you know, these we pick up these these concepts and, and these techniques along the way that allow us to make the change and the client to actually keep the change. Yeah, that's One, that's the important part. So quick question before we go, because I know one of the most prevalent things that I find people are coming for nowadays, which is, again, it's the body reacting first and yeah. then the mind freaking out is anxiety. So that's a perfect yeah. example of how you have to work with it first on the yeah. bodily level. And so how would you work with someone who comes in and they have severe panic attacks? Well, so um, there's basically two types of anxiety. Okay. Okay. There, there's a panic attack where they have a panic attack in response to a particular context. Okay. okay. And this is really, um, in terms of the structure of the problem, it's the same as someone who's got a fear of speaking in public or a fear of flying or anything else. There's there's a stimulus mm -hmm. uh, which um, the senses it goes into their senses. It goes past the amygdala. The the amygdala panics. Mm -hmm. Before the, the the signal has even got to the visual cortex, right? Because the visual cortex goes to the front of the brain. By this time, they're in total meltdown, right. and they go, "Here I go again!" Exactly. Right? Here my panic goes again, um, so that they have no uh, top-down control at that stage because mm -hmm. they're in a panic mode before they've even noticed um, what's going on, and then they build on that and they become yeah. afraid of the panic attacks. Right. Right. So if you have a person who has, for example, a, um, a panic style um, fear of flying, the biggest fear they have is having a panic attack. Right. Right. right? It's not the flying. It, it's because the panic comes first and then the prefrontal cortex goes, oh, crap, mm -hmm. I'm having a panic attack. Right. right, so, right. so so that's often the fear they they walk in with. I'm scared of getting on a, onto an airplane and freaking out. Right. Right. Um, so that's really the same as, as any other fear, um, where essentially you have to get the body in a different state okay. when it encounters the stimulus. Okay. So you. So, yeah. Go ahead. So so you have to get them into a state of calmness, a state of confidence, some other uh, state that's not panic, and then allow them to experience the stimulus that would right. normally take them into the panic right. attack. You're kind of collapsing it in the brain. You collapse it in the body. In the body, pardon me, yes. Right? You're, because you're now what you've basically done is, is you've calmed the amygdala. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. go to sleep, relax, amygdala, yeah. relax. And then the stimulus comes in, goes past the past the amygdala, but the, but the amygdala's like, hey, man, I'm chill. Yeah, I right? can and do And then it goes yeah. to the visual cortex, it goes to the, to the front of the brain, and the front of the brain goes, oh, I didn't have a panic attack this time. Mm -hmm. That felt okay. And then right. you and then you condition that, and then you get the prefrontal cortex to realize it doesn't have the the, the response. Right. So again, you're getting it in on all the levels, but the body first. Right. So that's the first type. The second type, the brain is basically a generalization mm -hmm. machine, right? It takes an experience and generalizes it out. Um, the more difficult case is the client who comes in and goes, um, "I have anxiety." Mm -hmm. When do you have anxiety? I have it all the time. Right. Right. I have free floating anxiety. Mm -hmm. What they what they actually mean is they used to have, be anxious about something. Mm -hmm. Right. They generalized it out and became anxious about a whole bunch of things. They generalized that out and became uh, became anxious about almost everything. And then at some point, their their brain and body said, "What the hell? I'll just be anxious all the time. It'll save me uh, right. save me a lot of work." Yes. Right? Those are obviously more difficult because you have to find something um, to mm -hmm. attach the anxiety onto in order to bring it down. Right, I understand. To do the exact same thing you described earlier. Yeah, but but, but you have to find a connection. So you have to do uh, something. It's often like a like a trick. Mm -hmm. So you'll do like maybe a, a re-imprinting or mm -hmm. you'll do something that um, – um, takes them out of this free floating anxiety and makes them anxious about something in particular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you can then change that and then 
generalize out from that. Right, right. Well, thank you for that, that amazing description on how to work with anxiety. And thank you for being with us here today. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. So I look forward to seeing you at this year's HypnoThoughts. Everybody, Sean is offering a three-day pre-conference workshop on Overdurfian. And if you want to get a taste of it, you know... Oh, actually, well, it's pre, so they won't be able to get a taste of it. But uh, if, wow. if for some reason you've already signed up for another course or whatever, just definitely go to his one hour and get a taste of Overdurfian hypnosis. Get a taste of what you missed. <laughs> a taste of what you missed <laughs> and what you'll sign up for next year. <laughs> yep. Right? Okay, wonderful. We'll see you. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks, Dee. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.